how am I standing? How am I speaking? Whatever the case may be is. And I'm always looking at myself, another adjective, I'm in service, right? So I'm serving. And when you think about serving somebody, you're not so focused on yourself. It makes right. it much easier to deliver. That's absolutely true. And uh, Roy, thank you. Just reminded me. We are officially on the record. I apologize. I didn't hit record. So right. for those that are just joining us, welcome. Uh, we are all professional speakers here. We're waiting for one more seat to fill. And we're here to talk about today how we use our voice ultimately to improve our business. You know, how we use our voice on stage. And we're going to talk about in the second half hour of this, we're going to um, try to keep the 60 minutes. And here is Jennifer, how you use your voice off stage. And in a couple of weeks, Hello. we're going to focus primarily. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, I'm so gonna, sorry I'm late. No worries. No worries. We, we got the ball rolling and then Roy reminded me to record because I didn't. Welcome, Sharice. And we're echoing, Jen, since she that was came me. in. That was me. I had two windows open. It should be okay now. <laughs> I think we're not even talking and we're echoing. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, good, right? Vanessa. Welcome, Lisa. Welcome, everybody. Uh, be prepared with questions, please. And Jenny, the questions is a backslash and a cue to pose a question. That's correct. Yeah, backslash and a cue in the comments. Hi, Lisa. Welcome. So um, we're going to just nab right back at you, Mac. You had used the word passionate. You used the word understanding. Right now we're talking about um, when you use your voice, what adjectives, What? how have people described you as a speaker? And I was mentioning that this morning someone said tenacious, and that I've never been told that. And I really, I put that in my bag. I thought that was pretty magnificent because ultimately what happens is you end up using these words in your marketing, but also they're very soulful and they show up on stage. So uh, Doug, bouncing up to you, when you use your voice, what adjectives have people used to describe you as a speaker? Sure, I, I do, it sounds it sounds stupid to be saying it like this, but like the, you know, uh, people definitely say that, you know, I'm funny. Sounds so stupid. I don't think that's funny. stupid. Well, it's like, I love it when people say that, yeah. <laughs> but I love, who is it, um, the, the comedian Russell, uh, I forget his name, the, the British comedian, he goes, Telling people you're funny is a little like walking into a bar and telling people you're, you know, I don't want to brag, but people find me attractive. You know? mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, funny. Um, I do get like nurturing or kind a lot. I get that one. And um, probably combined with a little um, with a little bit of silliness. It, those are probably some of the and soulful. I think people, you know, I think those are some mm. of the ones. That's yeah. a great word. Together. How about you, Miss Jenny Q? What adjectives have people used to describe you? And do you incorporate them in your marketing? Do you believe them to be true? Talk to me about that. Hmm, that's a really great question. Um, I think that the word that I get the most is enthusiastic. As I say very hesitantly, which is the opposite of enthusiastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I don't know. Here's what I don't know. I don't know how you can possibly be something that people observe and not also use that in your marketing. Mm -hmm. So whether or not you actually use that word in your marketing, if that's who you are as a speaker, I don't know how it can't come across in your marketing if in fact you are doing your own marketing. Yeah, and I think for, um, I would say for beginning speakers, folks that are brand new, that's, it's, hard, it's a hard thing to put together because you know, and I've said this and I'll say it again, I'll say it a thousand times because a lot of people, hi Jonathan, welcome. When I started as a speaker, I wasn't as authentic as I should have been, and not because it was intentional, but because I was trying to be what I thought I needed to be to be a speaker. So were you, would you say you were like uh, being more of an entertainer? No, I was trying to blow people away with my professionalism. You know, I was trying to be what I thought I was supposed to be, what people were looking for. Mm -hmm. And I have a big personality, and quite frankly, I stifled it for a long time. So I didn't actually use my own voice. I was trying to use the voice of others because they were successful. So, hey, maybe that works. And that's what I need to put on the table. And I don't think, I think when a lot of us start doing that, it's not intentional. We're doing what we think we need to do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, has this been your experience with any of you? Did you start with a voice that wasn't yours and learn to grow into it? Yeah, I think we all do. Yeah, definitely. When I first started speaking, I was working closely with uh, my sister and my brother in a business. And um, I tried, and I'm the youngest of the family, so naturally I'm going to try to be, especially like my older sister. And and then it finally hit me, I'm not. And all, it ha all that happened was I was ineffective and I, I wasn't having any fun. 
ineffective, you know, and there's another power word. Folks, pay attention to the adjectives, both positive and negative, because when they come out negative, if that's something you're feeling, that's something you have to be able to shift. Like disingenuous is a word that um, someone used to describe another speaker at a conference I was at. And it stayed with me because I listened to her. She said disingenuous. I sat back and I leaned and I listened and I said, yeah, I, I can see where she's getting that from. So that's where, you know, we're, we're delivering a message intentionally. And I don't know about you folks, but I think you're all on the same page. I do want to change lives with that. If one person hears me and I say one thing that makes them sit back and go, whoa, whoa, she's right. Not right because I want accolades, right because they, have, they understand that's the rhythm we have to move into and the way we have to go to be successful, then I've done my job. So, Mac, talk to me a little bit about when you're on stage and you're delivering and you're changing lives with your message. I've heard people say that they it's like they float off the stage. They're not even there. They're so passionate into their message. I, I There's a word that I've heard about other speakers that is very bad. Plastic. Plastic. Oh, that's you never want to be plastic. <laughs> I have a ever. question. I have a question, Mac, along yes. that. I, I, else the way, have, yeah. What? I said hello. I didn't say hi to you. I'm sorry. Hi, Mac. I, like, I know that's what happens when you come in late. I think yes. I was thinking we need to just call it what it is. One good trait of a of a good speaker is to be on time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just address the elephant in the room. We're done. Okay. <laughs> but so Mac, when you I want to know if this happened for everybody else because Mac, when you said plastic, I immediately had a speaker come to mind. Immediately. That is plastic. <laughs> totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. And he's actually a big name in the self-help and motivational industry, but I've worked with him. I've met him face to face and face to face. He's so plastic. I can't even add any credibility to anything he writes or anything he speaks. Right. But he's, he's credible to some. He is right. So isn't that a less a takeaway too? And I, so I, I just recently, I had to uh, drive down and uh, pick up my dad from Virginia and drive him back. Right. He's, he's a little older. So when I went down there and I, cause my aunt, you know, my family knows what I do and, and so my aunt pulls me to the side and we were having lunch and she said, so what have you been up to? I was like, yeah, I'm speaking. And then, and she says, you know, I have to say this about you. And this was, I totally unsolicited. She says, I have to say this about you. I can see you doing that and I can see it working for you. She says, because when you speak, the word she used was you're believable. Ah, nice. And that stuck with me and it was so nice to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, so, and some people say that I motivate them and that I inspire them, but I'd much rather elevate people than motivate them. If I motivate you, I push you Very along. Hard. If I elevate you, I can pick you up to a place that you've never been before and that you can't come back from. And that is always what I'm striving for. I'm striving to elevate someone. I'm striving to take something and, and or take someone and push them up to a place that they've never been for. And if I can do that through communication, what an awesome job we have and what an awesome life that is. And that's I love why that. I started doing what I'm doing is because of that. Because I, I have a voice, that. you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think that that is the fine line when we first start speaking. And I, I can only speak to my experience and to those that I have worked with or coached. And the hardest part in the beginning is, I think, the believability for themselves. One, that they can do it and alter a life. Because let's face it, we're looking rejection right in the face when we go up there. It's going to happen. It's possible. If you've joined me here or anywhere in the past, you've heard me say a thousand times, 30% of the people are going to love you. 30% are going to hate you, which is a strong word. And 30% don't give up. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about the other 10%. So we have to remember when we're up there, when we're using our voice, when we're delivering our message, that it's only for about 30%. And are you okay with that? Right. Yeah, somebody talk to me about that. I mean, that that happens. We get we know that there's going to be a sense of rejection, and if not rejection, you're never going to see it. Sometimes it's palpable, sometimes it's not. Why do you continue to go out there if you're not speaking to the masses, or are you? I think you know. I think it is the you know the story, the uh, National Speaker Association story about you know the speaker who goes and and very much what you were saying, yeah. Julian, about somebody comes up afterwards and says everything you said just touched my life, mm -hmm. and thank you so much. And the speaker goes, then you are the one I came here for. That's exactly right. That's that's how, exactly right. You know, that's how I always think of it too. It's think of the one person, not the, and you know what? There's going to be lots of people that we're not going to touch, but that's okay too. But 
when you are able to, like you said, Mac, when you're able to elevate someone, I, I think that that's there's nothing there's nothing better on this planet. You know, if you're if you're into it, you know, it gets yeah. it gets addictive for sure. The other thing about the plastic, I, I think this is part of it. When you think about plastic, what is the nature of plastic? It doesn't grow. It's not. It ha It's it's not alive. And I think one of the one of the things that's difficult for speakers who have found their voice, quote unquote, is that we are human beings and we grow and adapt. And then having the courage to not just have a shtick, you know, it like what actually could be an authentic voice at one point can become a shtick for people. Yeah. And I'm sure you know people like this, and I've met people who are you know multi million dollar businesses and empires. And you go, oh my God, you are like a facsimile of the person that, you know, you're, you're, you are plastic now. And I think part of finding our voice is to acknowledge that I think it's also a process. Like, I don't feel that I'm done. And I right. think part of finding our voice is ongoing. So it's interesting you said plastic because what's the difference between a, pl a plastic plant can never die, but it also can never live. <laughs> well, that's great, Doug. That's great. And it's true. And I like that you said, um, and let's touch on this and go with it. The message is ever changing. Like I made notes, I always make notes. This is the old reporter in me um, talking about how we use our voice. When I first started speaking, I would talk about how to overcome fear to follow passion. That was my platform, that was my message. And as I grew, I began to realize, well, you can't really overcome fear, you learn to walk with fear. And then that became my message. And then it kept evolving and today it's just figure it out, you know? So <laughs> however I design my talk, that's the message. That <laughs> I love but that. I like, yeah, That's I like so to think that it's a message that that it elevates. I love Mac. I love that. That's the purpose. And so, talk to me about a little bit. Any one of you, you're welcome to jump in when you're on that stage delivering delivering your message. What is the end goal? And I know that that's a very broad question. The answer could be, well, it's to make money. The answer could be, it's to get clients. The answer could be, it's just that I really want to be a voice that everyone knows. I would tell you that that's what I want with me. I want to be a name and a voice when people think of professional speaking, they think of Jolene Moody. How about you guys? I'm just putting it out there, it's the truth. No, I love it, I love it. Truth is always good. Um, I'll be, I'll, I'll follow suit. I don't really have an end goal. Um, that's great. <laughs> I don't have one. If, if um, I'm being, you know, hired to speak on a specific topic, I hope I do that topic well. But you know, as far as um, an overall, an overarching goal, I don't really have one. Um, so that's that's my answer to that. I don't know. Maybe what I need to you, have start with why. I'm, well, I I'm think good. you know what. Actually, hold that thought for one second, Mac, and we'll go to you, Jenny. I don't think that's wrong. I think that, and that's what makes um, a newbie speaker. They're never sure which category to step into. There's some speakers that speak based on their business and what is needed in the moment. And there's other speakers that actually build a talk that is structured around an actual thought. And those are typically like a keynote. So right. none of those are wrong. Mac, talk to me about um, how you choose your message, let's say in a keynote. And just to be very basic and clear, a keynote is a talk that is well designed ahead of time and you get paid a chunk sum for. And other talks like platform speaking or conference speaking is where sometimes there's not a stipend attached. Most of the time there's not, but you make money and you convert the room uh, by getting clients. So Mac, talk to me about that keynote message. How did you find it? So I'm, I am more, I, I just want to preface this by saying I am more of a conference workshop speaker, cool. a platform speaker. I do do keynotes though. I think for keynotes, I spend a, a tremendous amount of time understanding my audience. Because at that time, see, so so let's let's make a finer distinction here, right? So okay. platform speakers versus keynote speakers. For keynote speakers, I'm in service of the person who hired me to speak to this audience. That is my client. And my main objective is to make them not look bad. <laughs> my right, my main objective is to be stellar and serve that audience, right? So I'm trying to serve them. So when I'm trying to structure that keynote. I want to understand what the problems of that audience are oh, and yeah. do the best that I can to address their pain points in whatever allotted time that I have. Everybody write that down because that's the exact purpose of any talk. Say it again, Matt. Absolutely. I want to find out what their problems and pain points are and do my best to serve, solve, ease, assist 
in 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 if I can't solve, maybe I can ease <laughs> those pain points for the allotted time that I have. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Doug, Jenny, would you say that's exactly what you're doing when you hop up there? Yes, but at the moment I'm typing up what he just said so people can copy and paste it. Thank you so much. So oh, let's throw this up to Doug. Doug, yeah. would you agree yeah. with that? You know, I used to I used to do quite a bit of I was very active in the NSA and I was uh, much more of a uh, you know I was much more the speaker of the you know do keynotes and I've done lots of keynotes and 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 that kind of thing and I I realized that wasn't necessarily where my heart was. Um, mm -hmm. I, I also switched topics completely. I used to do uh, fear and I used to do relationships and uh, and I switched topics because now I really talk about podcasting. And so for me, mm -hmm. I think right now when I speak, it's more about I, I like being an evangelist for podcasting. So I like what you said, Mac, about it is definitely about helping people with their challenges. But I also feel like people don't even know about like I'm hopefully I'm also raising their awareness about things that exist. Did we lose Jolene? Yeah, we did. We <laughs> okay. Fresh. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully I'm raising I'm raising their awareness about you know about podcasting and of course you know to build my own brand, but also really kind of I think of it as more like um, as it sort of to be an evangelist of podcasting is kind of a big part of why I speak now. Am I, am I back, you guys? You can all see sure, me now. Yes, you're back. Yes, yes. I just like to leave to get, keep you all on your toes. <laughs> I think you, you know. I think you should do that every once in a while. You know, you <laughs> talk amongst yourselves. I mean, that's how, that is a, a, a pure test to see how you can keep moving as a speaker. Exactly. You know. Exactly. I think one of the greatest assets I have behind me is that I used to go live on television. You know, when when I'd have to do a live shot as a television reporter, it was I had no idea I was priming the pump for myself the way I was. So, it is yeah, a beautiful oh, thing. Right. Oh yeah, what a great yeah. thing, right? I mean, when I first started, I remember I were live so much on that teleprompter, and if it froze, so did I. You know, <laughs> I froze right there with it. So, thanks for carrying that on. So, the thing that I like about this conversation is that I think we're putting at ease our friends in the column over here, because a lot of times people are really uncertain with where to begin. And they think once they have that beginning and that talk defined that that's it, that there can't be more. I come from the school of thought that I think there can be more because I speak in two ways. One, I do a lot of conferences and teaching to businesses. So I have completely different talks built there. And then there's the keynote realm. Well, like I'm doing um, a breast cancer awareness dinner in October. Um, a college talk in November. And that college talk is the same talk that I am trying to sell to associations. So I've mm -hmm. learned this far into the game how to build a talk to cater to the two. Mm -hmm. Can any of you speak to how it's okay to have more than one talk, if that's the school of thought you agree with, and how you change them for your audience, if necessary? Mac, you want to go? I like your head nodding. You, you pulled me right in. Like um, this. <laughs> yeah. So, so I have, so I, I'm, I'm from this school of thought. Y you have to kind of do a self evaluation of what your values are and here's what you stand for. Here's what you, here's what you're against, whatever your talk is about. You're either for something or you're against something. Right. And you've got it. You've got your core message. And if your core, even if you have multiple talks, I don't think your core message is gonna shift. Now, if you talk about molecular degeneration or something very scientific, that's a little different, right? But even in that, you're gonna take a stance, you're gonna take a position. So I like having a core message that I can kind of rotate around um, and talking points that I can rotate around. And then I kind, of, I kind of customize the talk based on that, which makes it very easy for me to pivot my message to different audiences. So if I have a, if, if, if you think about it like, um, if, even if you think about it like building a website, building a website from scratch versus taking a content management system like WordPress or whatever, I have a framework already built and yeah. then I can just kind of add on to it to customize for that audience. That's kind of how I approach it. So I try to make it, you know, modular in that sense, as opposed to me having just a bunch of multiple talks. Yeah. I do, I do think though, having multiple talks, if you're doing keynotes to serve multiple audiences is okay. But how does that affect your brand in the sense of what are you known for? 
So that's I think that's, that's the concern. Like, so you don't want to be talking about, and that's what I'm saying. Like, what are you for? What, what are you against? You don't want to have one talk where you're against the same thing that you're for in the, in another talk. <laughs> oh well, gosh, I hope not. <laughs> and I've seen that. I've seen, yeah. So, I've seen so that we could file that under uh, consistency or authenticity. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's great. You know, I really like that you see my speaking is entirely a different focus and base than yours. Mine isn't pro or against, you know, for or against anything because mine's instructional. So mine, I have to adapt for the audience because I'm talking about social media. And so I have to know my audience really well because I don't want to speak above their level mm -hmm. and have nothing make sense. And I don't want to speak below their level and have them think, why the heck is she here? Right. Um, so I can have as diverse groups uh, as um, I was asked to speak at LinkedIn Live um, when they came to Boise. And so, you know, that that was a challenge because it, there was a full range of people in there um, from the brand new small business owner to the CEOs of major corporations. So that was a challenge. Right. Um, but when I'm in a smaller group where it's a bunch of tech people who are so into tech, but yeah. they have no idea, really, they know social media exists. And that's about as far as it goes, you know, but I have to make sure that I'm using words. So, I mean, so the answer to your question is, yes, of course, you have to be adaptable, but it can still be the same message. My topic is always social media. I think if you're trying to memorize a talk and I had this conversation with someone recently, your heart isn't there. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, in the beginning, I think, and I always go back to the beginning because I know there's a lot of people, I call it, that are in that space in between, where some of them have started and they don't know how to quite grow themselves, or they're in a space that they've been in in a long time and they want to move into that space. Maybe it's moving into keynote talking. But um, adapting to the message, have you ever, has anyone ever been in a situation where you've had to really seriously adjust your talk because of the audience? Yeah. Jump in with that because that's good information. Because you've got to be ready. You've got to be on your toes. Oh my gosh, I, I can. Um, I'll share with you what this is. One of the last. Now I mostly do podcasting and and talk about social media stuff. But uh, one of the last like keynotes I did on my old kind of world of more of the self help side was uh, I, I did something the healing power of laughter, and it was uh, the day after my divorce. It was. Uh, <laughs> I should, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I wasn't thinking very much. <laughs> I was hilarious. Look at the black space. <laughs> well, wait, wait, maybe you needed a laugh. You needed a laugh that day. Though. I needed a laugh, yeah. right. And it was. I, I want to hear that one. Very what, stern what lunch ladies. 880 really stern lunch ladies in the South. And as you can hear from my Southern accent, you know, I. I, <laughs> I that was your audience was 800 lunch ladies? That's fascinating. And, what do you talk about? And, you know, it was, <laughs> I um, It was, I mean, you want to talk about, it was just awful, of course, because I wasn't, I mean, my mind was not there. What was I, you know, if I had had any thought, I would have not taken that keynote. But I was immediately, one of the things that happened, though, is they, you know, I had this whole thing planned. I was talking about, it just was culturally totally off. I was culturally totally off because mm -hmm. I didn't get the South and they didn't get me. And they, they kind of got me off stage, and immediately I was replaced by the Butt Sisters, who are these three guys with giant prosthetic butts dressed like women, and they killed it, you know? <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? Uh, first of all, I love that you shared the contrast, because, and I love that you said you bombed it. I've bombed talks, and the last talk I bombed, quite frankly, it wasn't that long ago, and the reason I bombed it is because I chose not to be prepared. I thought I could wing it. Mm. And Ooh, interesting. While, while I have covered this content over and over again, I thought I'm going to talk about these four bullet points and I'm just going to put them right here on the podium and I'm just going to glance and mine's going to be organized enough. And I'm sorry that I did that and I will never do that again because I didn't feel a connection with my talk. So I didn't feel a full connection with my audience. I mean, there, yes, there were people that said I did great, but I think more people thought, than not. So I appreciate <laughs> so, your honesty with that. And I wanted to throw my hat in the ring saying, I've done it too. You know, I thought that it was going to be easier than it was. And I think the room was filled with, it was like a homeowner's insurance. I don't even remember. That's how bad it was. I just thought, <laughs> oh, they'll just love this message. So 
Um, I appreciate that. Jenny or Mac, do you have stories where, like that where, yeah, talk to me, Mac. Well, how did you bomb it? How were you naughty? The very first speech that I ever gave where I got paid for was at a high school and I got 150 bucks. I told everybody, I want to be a speaker. I want to be a speaker. <laughs> Word of mouth got around. I got 150 bucks to speak to a room full of kids. Now I had an hour and 15 minutes allotted or an hour allotted. I was on stage, I think 12 or 15 minutes. I was totally unprepared. I didn't know I had an hour allotted. <laughs> and I was so nervous. And I like you, Jolene, I had bullets. Now, here's what I've learned. Here's what I've learned. And there's a couple other times I bombed too. Most of the times when I bomb, I'm speaking in front of an audience because I'm a very topical speaker, right? I teach it uh, because I'm also a professor at NYU. Um, I teach business and, and digital and social and all that stuff. So it, it, when I speak in a, for a subject or a discipline that I know nothing about, I'm going to bomb. But if you put me in my pocket, I can do six hours cold. Right. I can do a day cold. But when I bomb is when I accept something I know I shouldn't be talking about. Wow, that's yeah. great. That's powerful. Know that. Yep. That's Just great. because yeah. the chat knowing, is there. knowing what we are and then knowing what we're not, right? Yes. The power yes. To know too. Uh -huh. Yes. That's you need right. to be able to say no if you know that w what they're asking you to do, you're not a good fit for. Like the healing power of humor of the day after your divorce. <laughs> I was asked uh, when I first started the speaker, and I, I, I think we dive into this a lot, and I, I now try to encourage new speakers not to do this because I've made all these mistakes. I had a Rotary Club ask me if I could talk about social media, and <laughs> I'm not a princess there, you know? And I was like, sure. And it's funny because I had the day before I had been at a conference where I sat in on an hour of social media education. So I looked through her stuff, went online, and spent about four hours building a talk on basics and delivered it, and afterwards said, I'm never gonna do that again. That is not where I live. That is not right. what I'm good at. Right. And so I think part of becoming a good speaker is yeah. genuinely using the voice that you want to use, like what you wanna teach on. There was a gentleman I was talking to just today. He doesn't realize this yet, but once I sit down with him, he will. He said, I'm not sure what the message is, but he already has it. It's already there. You know, sometimes the words we start with are, I want to inspire. Okay, let's pull that out. Why? Because something happened to you somewhere. It's like, does anyone in this little square or even on the side, does anyone have any tattoos on your body? <laughs> just, just me? Every time I go in for one, the last one I went in for, I had the word brave etched on my arm. And the tattoo artist said, so what's the story? I'm like, what? He said, there's a reason you're in here. There's a reason you're getting inked again. What's the story? And that's exactly what it's like when you know within you that you want to use your voice for something. It's because a story has triggered it. So can any of you share with me a story that helps to inspire you with any talk? I don't care if you were teaching social media or business. I, you know, before we, before we go there, can I share my bomb story? Oh, oh yes, that's it. right. <laughs> Because I, I can't, it's not that I, it's not that I really want to share the bomb story. It's the lesson I learned from the bomb story that I want. Actually, there were two. Anyway, one of them is not necessarily personal. It, it was technical. It was at the LinkedIn Live where I was speaking, and their setup was so poor that I had my slide show up, but it was exactly on the same wall that I was at, and there was no screen here for me to see what was going on. Oh yeah, so there was no way for me to know which screen I was on, and then on top of that the remote wasn't working. And so I had to verbally say to the AV guy in the back of the room, next slide, please. It was oh. awful. So that was that had nothing to do with me, but trying to overcome it in the moment in front of 200 people, that was you know, not the most fun thing. But here's the real bomb story, okay? This is 100% personal. So I was flown into Omaha, Nebraska to speak in front of 150 people as the expert and uh, I was brand, brand new in my position. I was brand new in success and it was all 100% ego. Um, I still think back and I, th I just cringe at, uh, you know, what people must have been thinking because um, if, 
if by the, the some grace I gave anyone one little nugget, that would be a miracle. That's all that was. <laughs> So I'm, I'm really being serious. And so what I learned from that was it's never, ever, ever about me when I'm speaking ever. It's about Amen. what do Amen. I have that I can give. And I, what I find is that also helps alleviate the fear because now I'm not worried about which 30% like me, which 30% don't, which they're, you know, uh, now I'm thinking about the message, sharing it and being really clear on that. Yeah. Um, so that helped me, but seriously, I can have, if I, if I let myself go there, I can just have super cringe, cringe fests over that ones. Yeah. But not good. But, but I also think it's what you're passionate about, right? Like, like, what do you, what do you, what are you passionate about? Like, Evidently, during that one, I was passionate about myself. <laughs> no, I, I First mean, of all, I Jennifer, I love that you were so honest about that. I love that you yeah. admitted it, ego, because every single one of us in here has it. Yeah. And we are not without it. It's how we manage it. Mac, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's cool. No, and I didn't I didn't mean to. I wasn't saying, like, what Jennifer is passionate about. It's like just you as a speaker, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, what are you passionate about? Like, what do you get up and talk to your friends about for, 20, you know, for 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 eight hours on on a weekend, you go away right, and you're like, well, I'm you know, you're into politics, so you might talk about Trump, or you're into hardware and you talk about drills, or you're into sports and you talk about your the foot the Jets or whatever you're into. If if you can talk about something, if you're passionate about something, I'm very passionate about what I speak about, and I'm I'm very into it off stage. So when I go on stage, it's an extension of what I what I invest my time in and the media that I digest, it comes back out of me. So what you invest and digest will ultimately come back out of you as a speaker. And if you're investing and digesting in, in a topic or something that you are passionate about, it is much easier than to divest it out of yourself mm -hmm. back to your audience if, if you have that passion and that self-study. Mac, how do you help people find that passion? Because lots of people say, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I have a couple of exercises that I put people through and I make them write down a whole bunch of stuff. But here's a quick, easy way to do it. When I ask somebody what they love about, some, what do they love to do or what do they want to do or whatever? And, we've, and I've, got, I've got to do it quickly or even I've done this in some relationship stuff. I don't really do that. But when I have friends and they're like, well, you know, should I stay with my spouse or whatever? OK, so write this down. Write down everything that you don't like. Everything that you don't like. Well, I don't like this, and I don't like coffee, and I, or whatever it is. Write down the, the things that you don't like to do, and then look at what the opposites of those things are. Huh. Because something that you dislike on this side, it's because you have a love for something else on the other side. So for example, it's not that a lot of people don't like going to work or they don't like their jobs. What I found is, or like, because I work with entrepreneurs mostly, right? It's not that they don't want to go work for somebody else. A lot of the entrepreneurs I work with love their freedom of working for themselves. So it's not a dislike of a job. It's a love for their freedom. But they're not looking at that. They're looking at the job sucks. I want to get out of my job. I got this business on the side. I'm trying to get it. So write down all the things that you don't like and then look at, look at what the opposites of those are and start doing some kind of some some self inventory and I, I found out it takes some time it takes some mm -hmm. commitment but i found out of that process that that self exploring oneself like that though and having a coach and a mentor those those things will help people pull that out of them and start to explore things that they like and at some point it just it connects mm -hmm. that's what happened to me i was at an internet marketing conference because i was going to be mr digital marketing and I'm at the conference and I fell in love with the platform. And I saw a guy get up there and make $60,000 in 90 minutes. And I says, I can do that. And it just clicked for me. And I was like, it just, and that was it. So I still love digital. I'm still in it. But the, but the platform is thrilling to me. It's the most exciting thing in the world. It's like, what a great job. I love it. But yeah, awesome. it's, <laughs> it's a definite high. And I know that, you know, the context of this conversation is is how we use our message on stage and off. Yeah. And Jenny, we were in a lab where we were talking about this particular medium allows people to see what our fabric looks like. And I think if you are authentic, that 
the same person they're experiencing in this medium is the same person that they should experience on the stage. You know, absolutely. So um, I love the, uh, I, I wrote a study course called Convert the Room because um, a few years back when I was doing business coaching heavily, that's how it was one, another way to make money. I was selling coaching programs and I was converting the room to a five figure payday. Can one of you, and we can move it from Matt to another voice, um, Doug, before you leave, maybe you can weigh in on this. Can you talk to me about a lot of people are confused on how to infuse the business with the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about one, why that's crucial and two, how you execute it? Sure, um, absolutely. And then it, I, I'd like to, if you would mind, I'd like to share with you a quick exercise that I do with people about when they say, I don't know, I don't know, because I hear yeah, it. Yeah, that'd be great. So, yeah. yeah, as far as why is it crucial, uh, if you like to eat, <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if, you're, if you enjoy, you know, if you enjoy having a business, and making money, it is crucial to be able to infuse the business into your into your speech. And to be honest, I don't know how you feel how you guys feel about this, but I think the future is heading towards speaking from the stage to sell versus you know the days of people getting massive paydays from you know I, I know people who just want to they're like I want to be the next Les Brown. There really isn't a next Les Brown. Uh, the world is changing, and there's lots of Les Browns. You know there's there's not, there's not going to be in that same way. The world is more diffuse, and we're not going to have, you know, I, I just think it's going to be, we're, we're shifting into a different place. What's really cool is we now have platforms like this, which never existed before. I don't think, some people are like, oh, I don't want to, I, I, I just want to be inspirational. So it, it's a matter of like, to me, it's sort of the, the spectrum or the continuum. So there's people who are too much on the side of business, and they don't, share anything inspirational they don't you know and from the moment they start they're pitching you right so we tune those people yeah. out because we know they don't care about us they're just on the stage to get something right on the other hand if you're just too inspire if you're just inspirational you go thank you folks you know amen and everyone claps you go that was the greatest speaker on earth but if your intention was to pick up more clients or to sell you know to sell back of the room it's not going to work right so I find that the, the people I like the most are people who simply, who are, who are really just accept that, yes, I do want to move you to action, but it's not like I'm, I'm not trying to sell you something you don't want or force you to do something you don't want to do. If this is right for you, I have an offer. I mean, all of us, I think, do transformational work. So really, it's not that I'm trying to sell you a lemon car or something. I am offering you an opportunity to transform your life in some way, right? Because the work you do, Jolene, the work you do, Mac, the work you do, uh, you know, Jenny is all, it's, in, it's transformational work. It's work that changes people's lives. So in a way, you know, there's, I've heard people say this and it's obnoxious, but I think it's true. And what I realized is when I look back to times when I wasn't able to influence people effectively, and influence is not twist someone's arm, but influence means move people to action. Mm -hmm. In a way, I failed them because if I really believe in my work and I do believe in my work, right, and I didn't move people to action, that, then I really in some ways failed as a speaker because if people get up and they go, oh, my God, Doug was wonderful. He's the greatest guy I've ever heard. But at the end of the day, I don't influence people to action. I failed. So yeah. That to me is sort of the importance of – being able to not just inspire, but also influence. I agree. I think what your comment about the keynote is very interesting um, because that's the realm that I have intentionally chosen to go. So less platform and more keynote. Um, and I'm going to start blogging about it in October. And that's what I keep calling the space between because there's three people that are going to get paid those large chunks of money. People who have overcome extreme adversity, celebrities, yeah. and experts in their uh, field. Yeah. So until I get hit by a bus and survive that, <laughs> oh, no, Jolene, no. <laughs> you know, but it's it's the truth. So, um, you know, it's funny because I have a different point of view as far as when you say the next Les Brown. I, you, I am so surprised by the world every day. You know, like all of a sudden, does everyone know who Ryan Seacrest is? All of a sudden, the dude was there. I thought Dick Clark was the last right. one. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, yeah. Ryan Seacrest surfaces. So for anybody out there that's um, that wants to go the keynote, keynote route, 
and again, unless you're in a, in a film next to Angelina Jolie or you've crossed the rivers walking on water, you've got to be the expert in your field. And there are ways when you start on these conference platforms that you can be asked to speak into rooms. I mean, I, like I said, the breast cancer talk, the people that have heard me, they heard me teaching. But they, what they liked was, well, I guess my tenacity and my honesty, all of those adjectives that we talked about in the beginning. So um, I think I see it playing out in two ways. And anybody that's in on the conversation, please weigh in. Please throw a question at us. We've got, it's 2.47 and I want to be true to the hour. But if you have questions about how to find the opportunities, how the talks were built, I mean, we've got all different speakers along the sides and right here in this room. Um, when you're crafting a talk, let me just throw this out because I know there's lots of different ways. One of the things I had talked about was a philosophy of mine is I'll build a talk. Sometimes there's slides, sometimes there's not. I have a habit, and this has been the past five years, I guess, as a speaker, where I start following the pulse of the room, especially when I'm teaching. What has your experience with that been like? And have you ever been thrown off when you thought you should follow the beat of the room and not your script? Anybody? Bueller? I'll jump on that. So it's so interesting because I have been invited on a lot of remote events like this, online events. And I've taught online and I've done live events and platform and, and taught in a the classroom. There is something, there's an energy that you get from the audience to meter that pace that you get in person that you just simply cannot get through a computer screen. So I love doing online, like right now we're all home, right? Or in our offices or whatever, and it's great. But there is a connection that I can make and I totally feel the audience and give it back to them. I totally- That's awesome. I, yeah. I totally want to do that because I don't want to be speaking to a hundred people because when you're in a room, there aren't a hundred people there. It's me and you, and it's just me and you. So I'm, even though I'm speaking to a hundred people, I'm trying to speak to you, Doug. I'm trying to speak to you, Jenny. I'm trying to speak to you, Jolene. Like it's just me and you there. So I'm going through internally extraordinary measures to try to connect with everyone on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I want you to feel like I'm just talking to you. So I will definitely pace the room. I will definitely, I'll speed it up. If I feel like I need to pick them up, I'll slow it down. I'll change my tonality. I'll, I'll, I'll play off things that happen in the room and tell jokes. Yeah. And, and, and if I screw up, I roll with it because that humanizes me and that makes everybody comfortable. Yes. yes. So, yes. so, and that, and all that kind of stuff is the reason why I win, I think in my space. And it's the reason I do more business because again, I'm human. I'm just a guy up in front of the stage and everybody's comfortable with that. And I've done so much more business being that guy than I was being trying to be like Jolene said, this, this person, I'm this inauthentic person, plastic person, I'm not. And pretending you have all the yeah. answers, you know, and I love that because I, I mean, in the beginning I did that too. And I, you know, I, I thought if, if they think for a second that I don't have the answer, they're not going to see me as the expert. When in fact, the truth of the matter was when I was extremely honest that's when people were like, you know what? You are fantastic. You don't know this, this, and this, but you know this. Right. Right. And you know that it's okay to not have all the answers. Any advice for newbies out there that are struggling with that, Mac? Because some new speakers are, they feel like they have to show up rigid, having all the answers. And I do agree with impression of increase. An impression of increase for those of us that have, if you've never heard the term, is where you show up big, but honest and sincere. It's a term that Wallace Waddles used in his, in his book, um, Think and Grow. No, that was Napoleon Hill. The Science of Getting Rich was Wallace Waddles. And he talks about impression of increase. Can you tell people out there right now, what happens when they hit that fear wall, when they think they've made a mistake, when their PowerPoint isn't working, when someone challenges them in the room? How do they stay heart-centered so their message is true and their voice is still their voice? Things happen. It's okay. So, so, so what I tell people is like, before you go on stage, if it's the first time you're going on stage, I want you to write down all the worst possible things that could happen. The stage is about to be set on fire. The curtain falls on you. Uh, the, your computer blows up and starts smoking and you don't have all of your material. What's the worst possible thing that could happen? And get comfortable with that. Be, because right, yeah. just get comfortable with it in your spirit and in your heart. If you get comfortable with it, 
whatever else happens, well, you're like, well, I'm not going to die, right? You're not going to die if your slides don't work. You got to wing it. Okay, give me a marker. Let's go and just keep rolling with it. What would you do mm -hmm. if it was five of your best friends in a room and you were teaching them how to do something you know how to do? What would you do? It blows up. Okay, well, let's get some chips and dip and let's just keep going, right? So it's the same kind of thing. So I just tell people, because I used to get very nervous. Now when it happens, yeah. It's very little on stage that can shake me at this point. Well, and I, that's great. I 100% agree with Mac. And another another way of looking at it, for a brand new. Now we're talking about a brand new speaker. Um, I have a sales background, and something that kind of makes sense for me here is when you're going into because when we're on stage, we're selling ourselves to a, to a degree, right? And so. Right. When you're in sales, the, the first thing that you learn is to overcome objections and you, you become even more effective as a salesperson if you address the objections before the other person addresses the objections. Right. So can you imagine, Jolene, if a brand new speaker goes on and they've been given the topic, I'll just use this, social media, right? <laughs> We've thrown that around a couple of times. And, and they say, hey, I'm here to talk to you about social media. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know anything about LinkedIn. I don't know anything about this, but here's what I know a lot about. Yeah. And this is what I'm going to share with you because this is where my passion is. Yeah. So just yeah. take it away so that nobody's sitting there waiting for them to be the expert in all things. I don't know. What do you guys think of that? That just came to me. I think that I always preface before I talk. This is how this has been my experience. Like this morning I did a talk on how to publish an ebook and I said, I am not a professional but this is my experience and right. this is how I did right. it. And I remove any risk. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I think I that also increases your value, right? When you say, listen, I'm not over here, I'm not over here, but I know this thing, you're, you're niching yourself down, right? So as you're doing that, you're increasing your va your expertise and your value in that thing. So I don't, I don't, I don't talk about LinkedIn, I, I talk about Twitter, because I know Twitter. Yeah. Right. yeah, I live in Twitter, right? Right. right, right. Yeah, you live in Twitter, so you talk about Twitter, it, incre it increases your Twitter value, or your value sure. to your audience. You know, and even within my own field, I very, I, I think the longer I've been doing this, the more, first of all, I never put myself on a platform, because a platform, or a pedestal, I should say, a pedestal, because a pedestal is a tall, narrow place, and there's no place to go but <laughs> topple over. So right. I, I make sure to never put myself on a pedestal. Like, so I don't think anyone who follows me is like, oh my God, Doug made a mistake. I can't believe it, right? So, yeah. which, cool. Which gives, I think, more permission for me to be, it took me a while to do that. I mean, I used to be, I used to totally be like deer to headlights, but it just with experience, I learned people actually feel closer to you if you're a human being. It took a little while for me to figure that one out. And the mm -hmm. other thing is, even within my own field, so let's say podcasting, and I say to people, look, I'm not the guy, like, if you want to know, you know, what's inside a microphone and all the parts of a microphone, like, I'm not that guy. Like, I don't know what's inside here. <laughs> you know, that's not <laughs> what I do. I'm not the tech, I'm not a tech guru. You know, I can right. barely use my computer. That's not what I do, but here's what I do. I help people get their message out. So even within my own field, I really narrow down, like, so that, because I used to worry somebody was going to catch me. You know, like I'm the podcasting guy. Shouldn't I know like how to construct a microphone? It's, you know, it's it's a safe bet to admit when you don't have all the answers. And I think it's the hardest thing for most of us when we start in business we, on our entrepreneurial journey, because we, do, we want people to think that we do have, we know everything, we have all the answers. But I'll tell you, when I show up without knowing them, People embrace me more. And it says, it's, this is so funny, S-F-X-T-X. <laughs> everybody said, everybody poops. <laughs> I think that's a book. It, but it's true, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I got a little bit of a giggle. It's my mantra to cocky MDs. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> well, it's the truth. And when you're humble in your, your, yourself, that's why I enjoy doing these blabs. And so um, I want to wrap it up because it's 2.55 and I want to be true to the hour. And I want to thank you all so very much for joining me and all of you on the side for joining. Share the replay and meet me back here um, Tuesday, next Tuesday. It'll probably be about three o'clock and we're gonna be talking about just more of this. It's called Speaker Pro on Blab. I appreciate the participation of all three of you. And does anyone else have any closing thoughts? Something so powerful that when this Blab closes, <laughs> these people say, God, this was incredible. I'm my mouth shut with that intro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I already talked about ego. 
That was, and I love that you said that. I appreciate that. My ego has gotten in the way so many times. It's not even funny, but it's humbled me. Yes. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Mac, any, I, I love your, your, um, well, I love you, Thanks. sir. Do you have any, I love you too, really. <laughs> anything you want yes. to add? In, in yeah. the interest of service, which is what I am about, I encourage all of you to, to don't waste three and a half years like I did before you go and get on the platform. I know people who have wasted 10, please just go find some people and get up in front of them and talk to them. Do nice. not wait, do not hesitate. D just go out there and do it. Do it now, do it today. Set the date and figure it out, work backwards. Please go, if this is your passion, if this is your mission, set a vision, go out there and claim it. It is yours. I encourage you to be the best you that you can be today. Please go get it. Go live it. Go love it. That's it. Jell Cruz says humility is the new cool, and you are so, so accurate. Any folding words for you, Mr. Doug? Uh, I love – one of the ones I love that I'm sure you've heard before is, you know, love, love the art in yourself, not yourself in the art. It is about us mm -hmm. in the sense that we bring our personality and we bring who we are. You know, it's not like we don't exist. You know, we should have a personality. But, you know, I, I love that saying about, you know, lo love yourself in the art, not, not the – love the art in yourself, not the yourself in the art. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. And we'll all stay connected. I encourage all of you to stay connected and let's continue to build this community. Awesome. Definitely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Delaney. Thank you, Delaney. Thank, Thank you. Take care, everybody. Yeah.